I think we should get straight to it and let's start at the beginning of your career. And I'd like to know how your meteoric rise happened, how you became a managing director at Lehman Brothers at the age of 31. Well, uh, hello everybody, thanks for being here. <laughs> uh, well, the, at that point there was really uh, very much of an apprentice uh, kind of uh, approach and it was the first time that uh, my class in 1972 was the first class of MBAs that uh, went to Lehman Brothers. And so um, there were very few people there and um, a good deal of business. And, and so I, I found it to be a great place because we had a ratio of only one partner to one associate. So you had to do everything because the partners didn't like doing a lot. So it was a, a forced learning experience and a really good one. And, and um, I got um, very lucky on one large project and, and uh, I was working as a, as a associate someplace in Chicago and I got a phone call on a Friday night um, from the head of a company that I had met once called Tropicana, which in the United States is an orange juice uh, company. And he asked me if I would come to Florida uh, Friday night because they were having a board meeting um, Saturday morning uh, and uh, to sell their company. And uh, he wanted me to represent them on the sale. And there was only one problem. I had never done a merger or acquisition in my life. So this is, um, this is what you call a high stress moment. And so I flew down there and um, there was a big snowstorm. So I didn't get in until around five in the morning and I wasn't expecting to be overnight so I had no clothes other than the same clothes I was wearing. And um, I had to be at the company at 7.30 and they, they gave me three different structures. It ended up being the second biggest deal in the world and I was just alone. And I was scared out of my mind because there's legal liability. I also was like making it up. Uh, and and uh, it was also a, it was a, a consumer product that everybody in America knew. Uh, so if you messed it up, they'd all know that too. Uh, and um, so I learned that, that the phone is almost always on the wife's side of the bed because I started calling the senior partners as fast as I could to say help uh, you know, I've got a few options. What do you think I should do? Uh, and um, uh, I'd never been to a board meeting before, so there were all these grown-ups there. Uh, and, and they had uh, two tape recorders and a stenographer taking down everything I said. And we got the thing done somehow. And uh, as I say, it was the second biggest deal in the world, and, and I wasn't a partner. I was just sort of a worker. Uh, so that was sort of, I guess what you'd say, was a, a bit of a breakout moment uh, for me. So moving beyond your time at Lehman Brothers, I'm wondering what the motivation was for you to go it alone and in partnership with Peter um, and to set up your own firm. Where did that motivation come from? Well, the motivation came from the fact that when, when Lehman Brothers was blowing up, I, I saw a lot of behavior uh, that I didn't like. Uh, the firm was founded in 1850. You could have saved it uh, when it had some big losses. Um, and the people who were 10 years from me, um, older than me, uh, were not interested in saving the firm. They just didn't want to get fired and take on the management that had mismanaged the business. And, you know, I thought I knew what needed to be done and nobody wanted to do it. Uh, they were not brave. And uh, so I, I ended up selling the business uh, to American Express Company. And I didn't want to be with the people who I thought didn't defend the organization. It was, it was sort of a moral position and so 
decided to go out and do something uh, with my partner who'd been thrown out the year before by the management that went in and ultimately blew up the company. And did you ever imagine you'd be so successful? Well, I didn't think about it like that. Uh, when we started the business, um, there were very few investment banking firms when I went into that field. And we had a you know, very big footprint. And I just loved the activity and the, you know, sort of the, the interesting things that were going on. So when we started our firm, I, I wanted to repeat that same feeling, but do it without all the people. Just like only do the most profitable things and do something that was global, where you had a lot of uh, feeds, a lot of things that were always going on. And, uh, that's what we did. I, I, I never really had a, an expectation uh, of what size would be and all that kind of stuff. I always just wanted to do great things and as many of them as you could and the rest of it falls out of that. And uh, yesterday we hosted Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, as we discussed, and in between his time in the Clinton administration and the Obama administration, he was COO of Citigroup. And I'm wondering what you make of the revolving door between Washington and Wall Street, particularly as your partner in founding Blackstone had been the Secretary of Commerce. Well, when, when, uh, when I was the age of the people in this room, um, it was very normal uh, to have people from the business world go into government uh, and, and come back. In World War II, for example, uh, there were a lot of business people that that went into the U.S. government, they were called uh, dollar a year people. Uh, and, and, and that occurred also in, during the Depression, uh, where successful people would go and work for the government for no compensation, just to help out. And, and that situation was uh, quite normal. And in, in fact, uh, uh, when I was in college, that was sort of a model that I, I thought I'd do. Uh, at some point, because that's what was expected. Now, now that sort of has some kind of a, a taint, uh, um, which s strikes me as odd, since most of my life it didn't have that. So what do you think the sort of trigger was when that taint came into play? I, I think it's more along with general populism and unhappiness. Interesting, because uh, one of the main things Secretary Liu spoke about was populism. Uh, so interesting that you're in agreement there. Uh, now, when I was doing some research, I came across a few quotations, and my favourite one is one I'm about to read you, and I'd like to ask you a question about it. And it's describing your view of the financial markets, and you say, I want war, not a series of skirmishes. I always think about what will kill off the other bidder. So I'm wondering, how do you kill off the other bidder? Well... That, that was the most unfortunate quote. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's been cited before. And uh, w what that was is, is, uh, is you know, you can just uh, tactically, um, you know, if you go to an auction to buy paintings, sometimes there are bids that go up by, you know, almost nothing. You know, so somebody bids $10,000 and somebody says 10-1 or 10-2 or 10-3. And, you know, what I was referring to there is if you say 15000 that usually shuts the thing down. Uh, and um, it usually gets up pretty close to there. But just psychologically, uh, at some point, there are different ways to play uh, a situation. And when you do something that's surprising, uh, sometimes it allows you to, um, uh, to, to, to end up winning at, 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 a, at a price that, that sometimes is lower than where you would have gotten to in some other way. So that's, that's really all it is, just a tactical description. Sounds a lot tamer than killing. Uh. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't do that. They, they always come back. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so on the point of your success in, in negotiation in business, um, Forbes 400 uh, gives you a self-made score of 8 out of 10, which is quite impressive. Um, do you think it's still possible 
in America's current socio-economic climate for a smart son of a dry goods retailer to become a billionaire? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we have a, like a really pretty remarkable system in America. We, we have, um, if you look, for example, just in the tech area, I, w I, was, I was at Stanford, I guess it was about a year ago, talking to a group uh, like this, and to me, it, it sort of seemed that everybody was sitting down playing with their laptop, and, you know, um, I, I basically stopped the, the discussion. I said, you know, all you people feel you're going to be billionaires two years out of school, and you could see. Yes. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they have smart students out there. And, and um, America has always been a country where there's been a real entrepreneurial spirit. If you look on the continent here, uh, you, failure has terrible consequences. Uh, and people tend to be very um, uh, orderly and buttoned up and, and relatively cautious. Uh, compared to in the States, where if you have a really great idea and it's totally logical, you're encouraged to go out and do it. Um, if it fails, as, as long as it fails for some like sensible reason that you couldn't have anticipated, then it's sort of like, okay, get yourself up, do it again. Uh, in Texas, where I was uh, two weeks ago, Almost every affluent person in the oil and gas business at some point was broke because uh, they're looking for something underground that you can't really see. So you have, uh, you know, sort of machinery and all kinds of other things. And, and, you know, but that's not the same as knowing what's there. And so there's enormous sympathy uh, for um, trying uh, sensibly, not having it work try it again. And America's quite tolerant. I'd say it's probably the most tolerant uh, country that I've visited or lived in uh, for that type of behavior. And, and so, yes, uh, I, I would say that, you know, it's definitely possible for people from all backgrounds uh, to become successful. It is really helpful to have a great education, uh, which you all here at Oxford are, are doing, uh, but people without that kind of high quality education in a globalized world really don't have as much of an opportunity uh, as, as people who have terrific educations. So we're gonna come on to education very shortly, but I just wanted to pick up on one of the things you said, and you sort of implied that failure is a rudimentary part of ambition and innovation. So what was your biggest failure in business and how did you come back from it? Well, you don't get to be successful in life without failing. I, I wish that weren't the case. It, it's better to be winning all the time, but it doesn't work that way. So my uh, probably uh, biggest um, uh, failure came, came early, and if you're an entrepreneur, which is, which is sort of what I am emotionally, uh, having big failures early uh, can actually be fatal. You want to avoid those, if at all possible. And in my case, uh, what, what happened is I, I, you know, it was the third investment that we made, and uh, we didn't have any processes. People would just walk up to my desk and say, I like this. And I sort of thought I was a little like King Solomon, you know, like, OK, do we split that in half? Or, what, you know, what do we do? Uh, and so I had a case where I could choose between two individuals and their views on an investment, and I, I picked the one sitting on my right who appeared much more knowledgeable, and um, uh, that was the wrong choice. And uh, we got in a situation where we basically were going to lose uh, all of our money. And I was called by one of our investors to come and see him, and uh, he uh, uh, I sat down in a chair in front of his desk, and, and he started screaming uh, at me. And um, uh, in my family, nobody ever raised their voice. Uh, I, I thought that was normal, apparently. That's odd. But in my house, it was normal, so nobody had ever raised their voice. 
And this man was screaming at me for what seemed like an endless period of time. I mean, and he, you know, he's saying I was unqualified, I was incompetent, I was a moron, probably all of which was true, which was even worse. And uh, I started, uh, my face started getting red and I, th I thought I was gonna start crying. And uh, I was supposed to be in charge of a firm. And I, I was just, just totally ashamed. And I, I left that, uh, that meeting and I, I took a ride back to my office. It was about a half an hour ride. And I vowed I was never gonna have another meeting like that in my life. We were never gonna lose money again. We had to set up different processes and we did. And the result of that is we, one of the best investment firms in the world, uh, certainly uh, you know, the largest in our class and all that type of you know, good stuff. Uh, but it all stemmed from this one miserable thing. And, and, and um, uh, at that time, uh, as, as mementos from transactions, they had what were called tombstones, where there were basically lucite cubes and you had something inside of it, uh, you know, describing the deal company A, you know, buys company B, or this company goes public, or something like that. And so I had a special tombstone made up for that deal. It was called Edgecombe Steel. And I did it in the form of an actual tombstone. And uh, inside it, I had a black, uh, you know, sort of background with some white letters. And I, I kept it on my, uh, my desk for several decades. So despite all the successes we have, I'd, I'd never forget uh, that one, and uh, it's still in my bookcase uh, 30 years later. So you find that adapting from bad things that happen uh, is really the mark of what it takes to become successful, because bad things can take you down, or learning from those things makes you much more adaptable and stronger, and, come up with new processes and approaches that protect you from whatever mistakes you made the first time. As a result of that business success, you've been able to amass quite a large, a very large personal wealth. Um, how do you ensure that that doesn't become a distraction? How do you stay focused on work when you're in possession of, of so much money? Well, first of all, you, you have to be aware it could always go away. So. Uh, it, it came, it can disappear. And the only reason it, it came is, is because everything you focus on must be perfectly done. Uh, and as you get bigger, you can never forget that. And, and so I, I believe that, that uh, we're sort of like a restaurant and we're only as good as our last meal. Uh, and if you poison your customer, with a really bad meal, even if you're a famous restaurant, you won't go back to that restaurant for quite a long time. If you poison your customer twice, they never come back. And, and so finance has more fragility uh, involved with it. And, and so every time we make a decision, it's like a complete life and death uh, situation and we must do it well. And so I don't, uh, really think about the financial consequences uh, to myself. I, I'm just thinking about, you know, how do we do something that's marvelous? How do we be the best in the world at what we do? And if we do that all the time, what happens is there are good things happen uh, to you uh, personally, uh, but um, you, you, don't, you don't think about it because uh, one, once you have your basic, uh, uh, you know, things in your life, your house or your houses or cars or whatever they are, you know, the rest of it is, you know, the more you accumulate, you're going to have to give it away uh, one way or another. And, you know, so that becomes a different phase in your life. So on that point of giving it away, what led you to create the Schwartzman Scholars and why choose to put your money into that as opposed to something different? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I really enjoy this one. Uh, I uh, started a, 
program with some of my colleagues who were sitting uh, in the first row. Uh, and um, uh, th this is to, to program like the roads, but instead of sending, you know, sort of similar kind of, you know, future leaders and, and people of potential influence uh, to Oxford, we're sending them to Chenhua University uh, in Beijing uh, to Schwarzman College uh, as Schwarzman scholars. So why did we do this? Uh, and part of it is a story. Um, uh, you know, uh, when our firm went public in 2007, uh, the Chinese government showed up without us asking them to and offered us uh, $3 billion dollars. Uh, um, and, and what was a $4 billion IPO. So for those of you who aren't financial uh, people, when somebody shows up to buy three quarters of, a, of an offering, it sort of says, why do you need the offering? Uh, and, and so we made it $7 billion, and it was the second biggest uh, of, the, um, of the decade, uh, first decade of this century, uh, second to uh, Google uh, that was larger than ours. Um, so um, I went on the board at, at the request of the government uh, to Chenhua University at their business school. It's called School of Economics and Management. And they have an advisory board there that's really amazing. And, and you know, they have many, many people from the government. Uh, and they have famous people from the business world. So for example, right now we have, uh, just in the tech business, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, uh, from Facebook, Tim Cook from Apple, Jack Ma from Alibaba, uh, Pony Ma from Tencent, which is WeChat uh, there, which everybody uses, Robin Lee uh, from Baidu. So th if you listed your top five people in the world, most of these people would be on that list. And, and so it's a fascinating group of people. And they were doing a fundraising uh, for their 100th uh, anniversary, so they came to me in the midst of the financial crisis, and I told them I had something better to focus on, like the financial crisis. They should go away. And they changed presidents in the normal rotation, and I was living in Paris uh, for six months um, with my wife, and he came to see me and, and um, basically said, we'd like you to do something uh, significant. Uh, and. Um, I had thought about what, what problems interest me, not what their needs are. That's something as advice I would give you. You think about what interests you, not what interests somebody else. And what interested me was the increasing um, prominence, power, and scale of China, uh, and the fact that I could see the beginnings of populism occurring, and that meant that people in society led by leaders who benefit from it um, start getting angry at somebody because they're frustrated. They could be legitimately frustrated in their lives, but I, I felt that after they go after income inequality and wealthy people and people in finance and other types of people, they'd start running out of targets and then eventually they'd go after countries. And one of the countries that I thought would be one of the first on the list would be China because of globalization and, and, and the fact that there's a professor at Harvard, uh, Graham Allison, who did a study in, in that when you have a challenger uh, country, the world order, challenging the incumbent, China is the challenger number two economy in the world, challenging the incumbent, which is the U.S., since the year 1500, uh, in 75% of those cases, um, there's been wars between the challengers and the incumbents. And, and so I looked at that and I saw this trend coming and I said, I really wanna do something to get in the way of that trend to try and change uh, outcomes. Because in the modern world, you can't have military conflict between two giant countries like this. And, and so I figured if we could attract, you know, sort of an amazing group of people uh, and send them to China for a year to learn uniquely about China, meet the leaders of the country, uh, uh, go on uh, trips and learn about other parts of the country besides just Beijing and Shanghai and Hong Kong, 
Uh, if you had a mentor from the real world who was a famous person in, in your area of interest, uh, uh, lived at Chenhua, met all the students there, that if you could have these unusual experiences uh, that, you know, for example, uh, we arranged for President George uh, W. Bush to do an interactive video with uh, the students their second week there. That was a lot of fun, actually. I, I was tuned in secretly uh, on my iPad, and um, you know, George was very relaxed and candid, and you know, sort of. The, the, we have a variety of really unique uh, type of uh, opportunities that, when these students graduate and go back to their own countries, that um, we're trying to select them to be leaders and people of influence uh, in their fields. And they'll set up a network um, among themselves and between them and their Chinese cohort um, that will allow them to interpret what China's doing. Sometimes China will be doing some things that are destructive of China's relationship and not even know it and feed that back sometimes, the rest of the world will overact, overreact to something that China's doing and they need just sort of more rationality. And so this group will provide that role and also in terms of being a network that's ongoing could affect other important issues. And so that's why I did it. Okay, um, and by 2030, your, the website points out, the, the Schwarzman Scholar website, points out that China will be home to one out of every six people in the world. It will boast 17 of the 50 largest cities in the world, and it will have more college graduates than the entire US workforce. And all of this is in a context of repressive governance and other human rights abuses. Should the US not be incredibly fearful of China's rise? Well, I, I think you have to look at this historically. Historically, I mean, China, China is over 5,000 years old. And as best as academics can put records together, uh, they've had about 20 to 25 percent of global GDP um, during that period on average. Uh, the, the low point was in the late 1970s when um, they had the Cultural Revolution and their GDP was about 2 percent. So they were going to be growing 10 times from there as soon as they could get their government straightened out. So I, I look at China's growth as, as really sort of um, somewhat inevitable and uh, China taking its normal place in the world. Um, they tend not to be an expansionistic country because um, they're so big uh, already. Uh, and I think the world's going to accommodate to that growth and accommodate to, uh, you know, a second global power. And it's a question of how you work together uh, productively. So, for example, on the COP21 uh, 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 environmental thing, the two basic leaders were China and the United States. If, if China hadn't signed on for that, you wouldn't have this environmental uh, framework now. And, and so I think there's a lot of area for, for common uh, goals uh, and you know, this is gonna happen. So the idea of being scared about it, usually when things happen, you're supposed to engage and, and have it come out to be like a win-win situation rather than driving people into corners where they overreact and you, know, you get like bad outcomes. Thanks. Uh, we're now going to go to the audience uh, for some questions. Let's go to the gentleman in the front row over there. Yeah, red shirt, or jacket. Uh, so obviously you've had a lot of experience with mergers and acquisitions, so I was wondering if you could take us through, let's say, the steps in the process of a merger and acquisi or acquisition, and what priorities you hold in mind at each step in the process. What, what, what are the priorities? Yeah. Well, the priority is just make the thing work. Uh, and um, so, so the, the reason you buy a company, you, you, you can do it two ways, basically. Uh, you, you can buy it with an existing company you own, in, in which case you're interested in, in seeing 
you know, what kind of uh, synergies there, there are, both for growing the company faster or eliminating duplicate functions. In other words, making the company uh, more, uh, more efficient. Um, when, when, when you buy a company uh, just freestanding, uh, you're, you're looking at the same factors, but it's, it's a little simpler be, because you don't have another company you're dealing with at the same time. And um, when, when we analyze things, we're, 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 we only want to buy something if we can make it much better. To buy something just to have it, that's like going into a retail store, right? You buy at retail and then you try and sell it to somebody, there's always a loss. Um, try that sometimes with jewelry. Um, that, you know, what, what you want to do is transform a business, make it better, have it grow faster. And what, what happens is the faster a, a, a business grows, the more somebody's willing to pay you when you sell it, whether you take it public or whether you sell it to somebody else. It also has some other uh, really good characteristics for society. The faster you grow a company, the more people you inevitably need to employ. And so they get paid more, and then that's a good thing. So, so the key is when you buy something, how can you make it better? So we do big studies, and we do it before we buy the company. Buying a company isn't supposed to be an adventure. You're supposed to take as much as the adventure out of it because there's always enough adventure anyhow, because you never really know as much as you think. But you're trying to make this as riskless an operation as you can. So on a normal thing, we have at least one or two consulting firms working with us to see how you can introduce new products, how you can grow faster. Uh, we have all kinds of experts, uh, and so, you know, whether you know, you can save money on their insurance or combine it. We have a group buying program uh, that we use at the firm so that when we buy the exact same thing for a company, we add it to the other companies we have um, so we have greater buying power so we can buy that cheaper. We have all kinds of ways that we analyze. At the end of the day, you sit around and figure out, one, can we ever lose money by buying this company? That's the first thing you have to do. And if you get, lose money with any realistic set of scenarios, you never do it, even to make a lot. I mean, making a lot is fun, but losing your money is dreadful. So, so you, never, you never put yourself in that position, knowingly. You've got to be very tough on that. And, and, and then you execute the plan after you buy it. And that, that's how we do things. And it tends to work out right you know, somewhere around 93% of the time. Uh, if you buy stocks, it tends to work out right, if you're good, 55% of the time. So I'd rather be sort of hitting in the 90s than a little bit more than fl flipping coins. Another question, please. If we go to the gentleman standing up over there. There's an amazing story about you that I'm gonna get completely wrong. Uh, about how you got your first job. Um, something like you couldn't get a job, so you started working at the Yale Alumni Office, and one day there was a family having a picnic, and you managed to start talking to the family having the picnic, and from there somehow you landed yourself up in an interview, I believe it was at DLJ, and when the guy asked you, you know, so what do you do or why do you want this job, you said, well, I have no idea what you do, but everyone seems so excited, I really want to be a part of it. Um, my question is, you, you probably hear all the time from people uh, who are about the age in this room how hard it is to get a job these days and get a first job and this sort of thing. And you talked about failure. So I, I really just had a simple question, which was, were there other families through the Yale Alumni Office that you had approached, that you had met in other ways, that you hadn't had the same luck with before you, before you hit gold with the, with the interview you did get? Well, I, he's telling a story, which is actually, it was a funny thing. Um, uh, I, was, I was working at a Yale reunion because I had no plans after graduating. I mean, this is actually pretty pathetic when you think about it. Um, and so I, I was just working to get some money. 
because uh, I forget what they were paying, you know, like $30 for two or three days, which was like 30 more than I had. And um, so I, 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 I was working uh, at a 15th reunion. These were old people. They graduated for 15 years, so they were 37. Uh, and they were, they were old. And they, they had children, so a lot of them. And there was a family just sitting, having, um, you know, sort of a, a lunch um, um, on the lawn. And I, I looked at the family. It seemed like, like an ideal family. And um, I, I went out and, uh, to a bookstore, and, and I bought Bob Barr the Elephant, which is a children's book that my father used to read to me at night. And so I just went over and I handed it to this, uh, this family and I, I said, I just want you to have this book. And the four of them looked up at me like, you know, who is this person? I thought that's a pretty legitimate thing for them to do. And I, you know, I just gave them the book. They said, why are you giving me a book? I said, because you look like just such happy people that I just wanted you to have the book. And then I, I walked away. And uh, the father came after me and he said, that was one of the nicest things that anybody's ever done. And I said, well, thanks. Uh, he, he said, well, what are you doing after graduation? I said, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> he said, well, you know, the, the, the reunion ends in another day. This isn't much of a career. Uh, and um, he said, look, I, I work at the Yale admissions office, and um, uh, why, why don't you come and see me? And so I, I saw him two days later, and he said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I don't know. Um, and um, he said, well, look, I've, I've got some friends who are my age, um, and, um, you know, 37, they're old. And, you know, I'll introduce you to some of them. And, and so um, I bought my first suit and I went down to New York to meet um, uh, some of his, his friends. And I had never been in an office building uh, before. And uh, the first person I met was the vice chairman of a, a big bank. It was pretty weird. He went up this elevator very high, and they had wide halls with white carpet. I couldn't imagine a business would have white carpet. And, you know, I walked down, there were like policemen there. I mean, I don't know why they had guards. They're up on like the 48th floor. And uh, who was going to do it? Superman was going to fly in and give him a problem. And, you know, I met with him and, and um, he said, uh, after a while, you know, he said, are you hungry? Well, students are always hungry, right? So, so you know, he opens this door, and there was a, there was a dining room, and with a, with a man with a white coat, and I, I couldn't believe any of this was real, and so we were eating, and he, he said, you know, I, you know, I'm going to offer you a job, at uh, Bankers Trust. I said, well, th thank you, and then he said but I'd advise you not to take it. And I said, why not? He said, you'll be really bored here and you'll last for a year and then you'll leave. So don't take the job. So I, I hadn't had much to do with grownups. So I thought this was a little odd, right? You know, the guy's giving me a job, telling me to not take the job he's giving me. And so I went back, saw the other guy and he said, how did it go? I said, it's a little strange, you know? So he said, okay, here's another one. So I went down to see, you know, the Bill Donaldson at TLJ who started the Yale, uh, uh, they call it Yale School of Organization and Management, it's Yale Business School. Uh, and so I didn't know what he was doing either. Uh, but, you know, he had like a great looking group of people there. They were all excited. and. I sat down and uh, he said, why do you want to work at DLJ? I said, I don't have any idea what DLJ does. 
but you know, wow, these people here look great and whatever they're doing, I wanna do. This is very scientific interviewing. I, I advise you not to follow my advice on this. Um, and, and so, um, so I, um, he said, well, that's interesting. So he had me meet all of his um, partners. I was completely unqualified. I was going into the army in about six months. Um, and they hired me. So he calls me and he says, uh, he said, okay, we're gonna offer you a job. It's $10,000. And um, I had no money. And um, so I said, that is great. That's wonderful, thank you. But I need 10-5. He said, why do you need 10-5? I said, because I want to be the highest compensated graduate of Yale University. 1969, there's one other person who has 10,000. He said, well, why should I care about that? <laughs> I said, because I care about it. He said, I don't care that you care about it. This is like 10,000. He said, by the way, in case you haven't realized it, you're basically worthless. <laughs> I, I said, yes, I'm aware of that but I still want 10-5. And he said, are you not gonna take this job at 10? I said, no, I'm not gonna take it. So he said, listen, let me call you back. <laughs> so he calls me back um, next day and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but okay, 10-5. <laughs> And, and that was the start of my career. So, so um, that was just nothing but a reward for being a nice person. In other words, I just did this for Larry Noble, who was the guy with the kids, for no reason, no motives, nothing. Just because emotionally, I, I felt connected to him. And, and he got me into his network of super, super achieving people. Uh, you know, the person who hired me became Deputy Secretary of State. He started the Yale um, um, uh, Business School and was also chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. But I had no access, no nothing. You're all better served than I was. You know, they have a career counseling here my career counseling was nothing. Another question, please. Yes, the girl on bench over here. Hi, um, my name is Fong. I'm an MBA student. Uh, my question is: the financial services industry has changed drastically since you know post the financial crisis. And and what kind of advice would you give us as aspirational yeah, the leaders? Financial services industry has gone through. Uh, um, a very difficult time under uh, uh, its, its new regulatory regime. Um, for those who bother to look, they'd find that it's not both, it's not just the financial system, uh, and, uh, financial institutions that are having a tough time, it's societies who've re-regulated these institutions. They're having a bad time too. And those two things are linked. And so uh, it's been very fashionable after the financial crisis to uh, take a very uh, harsh uh, regulatory uh, position, uh, which I believe is leading to very slow growth uh, throughout every country that's, that's taken that approach. And at some point that's gonna to have to be reversed because certainly in the United States, our financial institutions are extremely safe. We've shrunk them, uh, they're way more liquid, uh, but, but we've minimized the amount of lending uh, that's gotten done, which is one reason why these economies haven't recovered to the extent that they were expected to. So uh, it'll take some time more, uh, not convenient for you, uh, at this stage in career where that will reverse because we're gonna to need to get growth back for the benefit of, um, of the middle classes uh, and, and lower income people also in our society. You can't do that without you know, well-functioning financial institutions. 
But there are always uh, companies that survive that. In the olden days, like when I was your age, you, you would go to the very largest uh, institutions. They were very prestigious uh, and um, uh, you would get trained in a in normal apprentice uh, type of approach. That still exists, but there are relatively few of those institutions. There are many more other types of institutions, like uh, you know, we're in the, at Blackstone, we're in the alternative asset uh, management business, which means we do private equity and real estate and hedge funds and leverage credit and some other things. Um, so, 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 you know, there are other businesses that are smaller than ours that do some of those things. And those are good places to work because they're smaller. Uh, they, they, they aren't regulated in the same manner. Uh, as depository taking institutions where regulators are protecting depositors and consequently um, control um, those institutions. Because we don't take deposits from anybody. Uh, we, we raise our money from pension funds and university endowments like Oxford and other types of institutions, sovereign wealth funds, that we, we have the freedom to do uh, actually what we'd like to do for customers, and, and there are places like that in the money management business. Uh, interestingly, for those of you who have any mathematical uh, orientation, that the money management business itself is becoming much more quantitative, uh, and that that presents all kinds of opportunities uh, in different areas uh, uh, of finance. So, and, and finance is also starting new things because of technology, uh, this whole fintech uh, area, which is more like venture capital type of um, uh, opportunities to grow your, your own things. Uh, finance is a necessary part of a society. And uh, it always evolves, it always changes, and there's always a way to do things. Governments are, are trying to discourage people from going into finance uh, because they they articulate it as being unproductive. Uh, that's a political statement, I think. Uh, and you know, without finance, you can't grow an economy. And, and so I think there'll be plenty of opportunities, uh, um, but it'll be an evolving field. We have time for a couple more questions. We have the gentleman on the front bench here. So I was reading an article in Forbes recently about the Schwarzman Scholars, and it said that despite having the support of President Obama and the support of President Xi Jinping, you still came up against some challenges from the Chinese government in founding the program. Could you maybe talk a bit more about those challenges and how you overcame them? Well, the, uh, I think he was talking about the Schwarzman Scholars program, and uh, what, what problems we faced, um, my goodness, whenever you do something that's cross-cultural, that's never been done before, good luck. Uh, and uh, you, you're not even aware of all the things you're, you're going to uh, uh, encounter. Uh, and the Chinese system is a lot different than, you know, sort of the Anglo-Saxon uh, system. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we, we built a building uh, and the quality standards typically in China are much below what would be acceptable in um, the US or the UK. Uh, so I would say that was, uh, that was an adventure. Uh, and there's so many funny stories uh, with that. You, you, know, you can't believe it. We sent one of our people up into a, a quarry up in the mountains because we couldn't get the right you know, sort of stone because somebody shipped it wrong. And this poor guy uh, was a PhD from MIT. He's up in a quarry someplace trying to figure it out. So we, we had a lot of scrambling uh, that went on uh, with that. Uh, we were trying to do a fusion uh, uh, type of uh, teaching with Chinese uh, professors and professors from around the world. And that took like two and a half years to set up has been very successful, but the first few meetings are always, you know, like, what are we all doing here, uh, type things. 
uh, that worked out uh, really nicely. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, the, the whole workings of a bureaucracy in China are much different than, than here. I mean, you, know, you may think you have bureaucracy at Oxford. That's probably not the case. Um, uh, it's just they use their bureaucracy to protect themselves from illegal behavior. Uh, and, and so, you know, the first answer isn't always yes, right? In Anglo-Saxon culture, you know, a lot of times you just present something that's interesting. Somebody says, hey, that's great, let's try that. Um, you know, there's, a, there's more of a reluctance at the middle levels uh, of their organization to do new things because you can get in real trouble uh, because of all the regulations. The senior people uh, tend to be uh, pretty visionary. Uh, and, you know, so that doesn't always immediately, you know, translate down. So it's, uh, you know, um, it, it takes longer to accomplish something in China than it would, uh, you know, in sort of a, you know, Western approach because you, you, you have to keep going back up again if you can't make it through the middle layers. So it takes longer, it takes enormous effort. Um, but when you get it right and you have a whole country behind you, we have support from the president of the country. And that's, that's a big deal in China. Minister of Education, head of the country, uh, head of Chenhua University, which is you know, sort of um, the university that the president of the country went to, the previous president of the country. It's sort of their uh, power alley uh, university. Uh, depends who's ranking them. It's either number one or two in China. But you, you do something that's cross-cultural, no matter where it is in the world. If you're out of your native culture, it's more complicated. If you're in a place where, you know, in effect, there, you know, laws are like a creative concept. Um, you know, they don't have rule of law the way we would have rule of law. Um, it's, it can be challenging, but, you know, our first class of uh, students, unbelievable. Unbelievable. We selected amazing students. Uh, we have, uh, was it two Rob from Oxford? And um, we had 3,000 applications and first class 110. This little group of 110 people, besides being verbal and creative and really super smart, three weeks ago I get an email. They just won the track and field championship at Chenhua University with 30,000 people. It's 110 people. They won the Chenhua track and field championship. We didn't even select them to be athletes. <laughs> I say, so this, is, this has been so exciting. And you know, we have this beautiful building like modeled off of a Oxbridge uh, uh, college, except it it's, looks like a Chinese Oxbridge, uh, you know, with like the, you know, the peaked roof that slopes and the courtyard, you know, double courtyard like you have, except you got bamboo, you don't have your stuff. But, uh, it's, it's designed beautifully and people are incredibly happy and, and um, you know, it's, it's one of the few things that I've worked on that dramatically exceed expectations. It's one of the top programs in the world and and, you know, what's, what's wonderful is I get this steady stream of emails from people having unbelievable experiences. I mean, just off the chart, off the chart. So, sometimes you have to work hard to get something good, but we've done all the work for everybody. So now you, the people who go can just have a good time and, and learn uniquely. Uh. Let's go to someone at the back. Is there, oh, there's a blue jumper right at the back. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so I've been reading that a lot of um, sources of investment who would normally be giving a lot of their money to private equity firms such as sovereign wealth funds or big family um, houses or pensions are now directly investing by themselves without um, sort of investing with the private equity firms. I was wondering what you think that means for the private equity landscape? Does it make it stronger or are they 
a threat for you guys, or are they potential future allies and co-investment partners? Yeah, you know, the, you know, um, it, investing isn't totally as simple as what I described to you, or else everybody would be terrific, and most people aren't. I, I think it's pretty logical, and I can explain it that way. And, and so um, there's always shifts in the investment business. Nothing is stable because uh, in the investment area, there are no patents. So if you invent something or think of doing something, you start doing it. Anybody in the world can replicate what you're doing or replicate it with, with, with a spin. So you have to constantly be looking for smart ways to do things and, and uh, understanding that no matter what you did once, somebody's going to show up and play with it in, in some way. And, and so the trends keep you know, sort of modifying. It's, it's evolution, not revolution. And some of the customers become huge, say, well, geez, I, I don't need these people to do this. I can do this myself. Uh, and you know, there have been several periods where that's happened. Uh, usually, uh, you know, it's, it's a mixed outcome and, and sometimes misfortune, uh, you know, sort of visits people who do things directly because they can't pay people the same or even close to the same. So if you think there's any correlation between what you pay somebody and what you get, you, you should get better execution. Um, and, and so people try to cut cost. I, you know, you can't blame them, and, and do things directly. And if that worked out, there'd be more people doing it. Uh, it takes usually, you know, sort of three, four, five years because you, before you have any idea if it's working. Uh, and you know, that's about where it started. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, in in a, in a world where two-thirds of the governments have their securities with interest rates below 1%, and about a third of governments have negative interest rates, what that means is you give them your money and then you keep paying them interest. You're paying them interest instead of them giving you something. It's, it's really pretty bizarre, right? So in that kind of world where last year in the United States, um, about 80% of the universities lost money in their endowment. Uh, the average return for a pension fund was, was zero last year. If, if we can earn double-digit rates of return on a regular basis, um, and sometimes I think I'm limited by what I'm allowed to say by the SEC, but just take that as a given that it's a lot more. Then for firms like ours, we don't, we don't particularly worry about you know, whether a few people do things directly. All we know is, is if your alternatives are very low rates of return, and we do very high, logic would say they'd give you the money to do very high instead of doing very low. I, I realize this is a controversial concept, but that's actually what happens in real life. And, and so raising money in, you know, in, in our position at Blackstone now is radically changed from when I started the business and, and people would say, why would I give you any money? You don't know what you're doing. Well, that, I didn't know what I was doing. It worked out anyhow. But um, now, after 31 years, you have a long track record, and that builds up a certain level of confidence. And, and so, you know, if a few customers or relationships drift away, it's such a big world with so much money that, you know, we're more limited by the number of investment opportunities than the amount of money. Um, please do remain seated uh, whilst Mr. Schwartzman and I leave. But first and foremost, do join me in thanking him for a splendid event.